already, so I can just start with the everything. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Roberto, and I will be helping with tech support and moderating the chat. This session is being recorded. I don't work for Zoom, but if you are having problems, mention it in the chat, and we will see if we can help. Um, David here will be presenting about the wreck of the Medusa, and then after he finishes his presentation, we'll open up for a Q&A. But if you have any questions while you're hearing the presentation, feel free to put them in the Q&A box or in the chat itself, and then we will go over everything afterwards. So take it away, David. All right. Can you hear me all right? Hear you just fine. All right. Uh, so uh, as you said, my name is David Montgomery. I'm the host of uh, the Siecla, a history podcast covering France's overlooked century in between Napoleon and World War I. Uh, the theme of uh, intelligent speech this year is uh, crossings. And uh, so this is going to be a talk about uh, one of the less fortunate uh, ocean crossings of the 19th century. Uh, the name probably gave away uh, what's going to happen here. Uh, this is called the Wreck of the Medusa. Uh, uh, can you uh, see the second slide? Did that transition go through? I did not see the second slide, no. No? Oh, OK. Uh, let's uh, fix that before. Ah, there we go. Why is my screen sharing paused? Hmm. I haven't had this happen before. Let's try this one more time. My apologies for the technical difficulties, everyone. All right. Uh, can you see the second slide now? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, glad this is not a total disaster. Uh, so this is the Medusa. Uh, Medusa, in this case, is not a uh, monster from Greek mythology. Uh, it is a warship, a 40-gun frigate built in the year 1810. Uh, it's 154 feet long, 39 feet wide, uh, draws 19 feet of water. Uh, it's all told a pretty good ship for its day. Uh, uh, so very impressive. And so this is the story of how we get from this to this. This is the Raft of the Medusa, one of the most uh, famous paintings in world history by the artist uh, Theodore Ger Jericho. Uh, and this shows the aftermath of the Medusa's uh, final voyage. Uh, and we're gonna get into how we got from A to B over the next uh, hopefully 20, but probably more like 30 minutes. Uh, so I can sort of summarize this presentation in a single uh, sentence. In the year 1816, France's Bourbon Restoration Government to reclaim its West African colonies, dispatched an expedition led by the frigate Meduse or the French name of Medusa. So I'm gonna break this down. Uh, first of all, what the heck is the Bourbon Restoration? Uh, if you wanna answer that question, you should listen to the Siecla, but uh, in brief, uh, by the year 1816, Napoleon has been defeated twice, and uh, the foreign powers of Europe have imposed a new king on France, uh, King Louis XVIII, who's the younger brother of the guillotine Louis XVI. Uh, don't ask about Louis XVII, it's a long story. Uh, Louis XVIII is ruling a uh, divided France, uh, divided between you know, supporters of him, supporters of Napoleon, supporters of the Republic. Uh, he's also ruling a France as being punished by the other powers of Europe, forced to pay a big war indemnity. Parts of France are under occupation at this point. France has been forced to agree to all sorts of humiliating concessions, like returning all the artwork it uh, legitimately acquired from other countries over uh, a generation of war. And uh, Louis XVIII is sort of torn between old and new. Uh, that is to say, how much should he return to the old ways of the Ancien Regime, uh, where he grew up and his ancestors had ruled, uh, or to what degree should he accept the changes that the restoration and the rev that, that the revolution in Napoleon had made uh, on uh, France, uh, both culturally and uh, administratively? 
And Louis is sort of pragmatic in this area. Uh, he accepts a lot of these changes. Uh, just to give one example, uh, Louis will govern a France divided into departments, not the old provinces of the uh, pre-revolutionary era. Louis actually thought that a lot of the reforms that strengthened the administrative power of the French state were quite nice, thank you very much. But he also liked the old ways. And so you're sort of caught in the middle here uh, between supporters of the, of the new ways, supporters of the old ways, and the most vocal and visible supporters of the old ways, the ones who are constantly pulling Louis uh, to uh, restore more of the old ancien regime are the emigres. Now, if you want to know what the emigre is, uh, you should listen to my intelligent speech talk from last year, which is all about that topic. Uh, if you uh, missed it at the time, I, I also released the audio on my podcast a few months back. But in short, the emigres were political refugees who had fled France during the, during the revolution, uh, either because they couldn't accept the revolution or because the revolution was going to kill them, uh, both reasonable reasons for leaving somewhere. Uh, and uh, some of them had stayed away for a long time, uh, some all the way until 1814. Uh, and Louis, as the leader of France, had a choice when trying to fill the fairly limited number of government jobs that he had in the army, the navy, the public service. Uh, should he reward his, the loyal emigres who'd stayed with him for an entire generation uh, and, give, and give them new jobs? Or should he fill it with people who stayed behind and served Napoleon, uh, who were less politically reliable, but maybe more competent? That's oversimplifying things. Of course, there were incompetent Bonapartists and competent emigres, but uh, uh, you'll, you'll see why I drew this distinction in a moment. Uh, some emigres felt that, uh, you know, that their, their generation of sacrifice on behalf of the royal family, their refusal to simply make a compromise and accept Napoleon and get a job from Napoleon, meant that Louis sort of owed them. Uh, there's a famous uh, joke from the time. Uh, about a, an emigre who filed a petition during the restoration to be reinstated in the French Navy, uh, despite he, the fact that he had served since 1789. Uh, at that time, uh, this emigre, according to the joke, had been a midshipman, but he demanded the rank of a rear admiral uh, on the grounds that had the revolution not interrupted his career, that's the rank he would have risen to by this point. Uh, a very strong counterfactual, of course. Uh, in the joke, a, a government official responded, uh, tell him that we acknowledge the logic of his reasoning, but he forgot a key fact. He was killed at the Battle of Trafalgar. The worst part about these online presentations is you can't see how jokes are landing, but uh, I'm just going to assume that that just killed. All right. Uh, so that joke it pro didn't, pro almost certainly didn't happen, wasn't real, but it is a good introduction to one of the stars of uh, this episode. Uh, Vicomte Hugues du Roi du Chaumarey, who's actually a surprisingly difficult fellow to track down. I was unable, despite far too much work, far too late at night, uh, to find any painting or drawing of Chaumarey from the time. Uh, the best I could find is what you see here. Uh, this is an actor named Jean Yan from a 1990 movie adaptation of The Wreck of the Medusa. Uh, and just looking at his uh, smug face there and his costume, uh, gives you a little bit of a sense of uh, the kind of person that uh, Chaumarey was. Uh, but, you know, Chamoray is not a joke. Uh, he'd actually, he came from a family with a strong maritime tradition. Uh, he had enlisted in the Navy at a young age, and he'd acquitted himself in battle while still a midshipman. By age 27, he was already a captain, a uh, captain of a transport ship, but the captain's a captain. Uh, but unfortunately for Chamoray, uh, and unfortunately for a lot of other people, as we'll find out shortly, uh, Chamoray was a captain in 1790. And then he emigrated. And by the time 1814 rolled around, Chamray had barely set foot in a ship in 24 years. But despite this, you know, he was a Navy guy. That's what he did. That's what his family did. So when 1814 came around, uh, Chamray started filing petitions to be reinstated in the French Navy and given a command as a captain of a warship. Uh, Chamray was uh, dedicated to this. He was well-connected. Uh, he was politically loyal. And in 1816, all this paid off. And he was successfully appointed to become the captain of the Medusa and the commander of the expedition that we're going to talk about shortly. So, uh, Chamray's expedition is going to reclaim France's West African colonies. What are France's West African colonies? You might be envisioning something like this. 
Uh, this is French West Africa on the eve of World War I, a uh, vast swath of uh, Northwestern Africa under French control. And of course, France held nothing like this back in 1814. Uh, you might be envisioning something closer to this. This is what uh, France's African colonial empire looked like in 1880 uh, with Algeria and then uh, Senegal. Uh, just a, a little nub there along the coast. Uh, and this is closer uh, to what things look like back around 1816. Uh, but we got to keep going because France's colonial empire in Africa at the time really looked more like this. It was a couple of cities, uh, ports or bases uh, on the Atlantic coast, uh, uh, especially the, the city of uh, bases of Saint Louis and Gore uh, at the mouth of the Senegal River. Uh, these were here for commerce, not uh, mass settlement. Uh, these uh, had been subject of rivalry. Uh, the French had muscled out the Dutch. The British had tried to muscle out the French. They'd been taken and seized back and forth, including during the, uh, the revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, when Britain had seized these colonies and run them themselves. And despite some British temptations, uh, after the Napoleonic Wars ended, Britain agreed to return these colonies to France. I mentioned these were here for commerce. Uh, There's uh, a lot of commodities flowed through these ports, uh, gold, ivory, gum Arabic, which is used for uh, a range of uh, medicinal and artistic and uh, industrial purposes. But of course, we can't get away from slavery. Uh, these were perhaps above all else slaving ports. Uh, the Senegal region, broadly speaking, was a major center of the 18th century slave trade. Uh, Saint Louis and Gore, uh, uh, principal among it. All these numbers are at best educated guesses, but one academic in 1969 estimated that over the roughly 100 years from 1711 to 1810, there were an estimated 190,000 enslaved people who were shipped out from this region of Africa, uh, the so-called Senegal or Senegambia region uh, for the new world uh, and other places as, as slaves. You might have seen uh, this image on the right, the so-called door of no return, uh, a common emblematic image of slavery. Uh, that's in the, that French slaving base of Gore that we saw on the map earlier. Uh, so as I said, Britain had ag agreed to return its colonies to France, but there were some caveats. Uh, abolitionist sentiment in Britain by this point was pretty strong. And as part of the treaties that ended the Napoleonic Wars, Britain forced France to abolish the slave trade, not to abolish slavery altogether, but to stop at least taking new slaves from Africa and shipping them to the new world. Uh, uh, in 1814, actually, uh, you know, Talleyrand had been negotiating, had been able to secure a five-year delay before France would have to abolish the slave trade. Uh, but after Waterloo, France had significantly less leverage and was forced to accept immediate abolition, uh, at least on paper. Uh, so the Medusa was, uh, on paper, supposed to end slavery in uh, Saint Louis and Gore. Uh, they were bringing settlers who would you know, be given land and would build farms, establish a different kind of colony uh, based on agricultural and maybe industrial production, rather than just uh, slave trading. But in practice, uh, French officials in uh, Senegal turned a blind eye to uh, illegal slaving during the Restoration. As a quote from an English observer who visited in 1817, it must no doubt surprise you that after the solemn manner in which the French government engaged to abolish the trade, that should be carried on here so openly without any interruption from the authorities. Uh, in 1818, uh, the uh, colony of Saint Louis passed a law uh, criminalizing slave trading, but the punishment for slave trading was less harsh than that for stealing a loaf of bread. So. Uh, which you hear was a lot harsher than the punishment for stealing a loaf of bread would be now, but still, uh, the message was sent and uh, sort of almost in the open, uh, slave trading continued. Uh, uh, thousands of slaves and, and slaving voyages uh, leaving these French West African ports until the 1830s when the French got a little bit more aggressive about actually stopping this. In 1816, the, the town of Saint Louis was a slave town, really. As you see, about 500 Europeans, about 2,000 free Blacks and, and mixed race residents, and 7,500 slaves. Uh, and these slaves were under no obligation to be freed. It was the slave trade, again, that uh, France had agreed to, to stop. So 
we've come now to the actual expedition led by the Medusa uh, from, from France to Senegal, to Saint Louis. Uh, the Medusa was not the only ship in this expedition. Uh, it was also joined by the Echo, which is another modern ship under uh, a fellow named uh, Francois-Marie Cornet de Vénancourt. Vénancourt, uh, like Chaumaret, was an émigré uh, from an aristocratic family. But unlike Chaumaret, he had a, a fair amount of fairly recent naval experience. And also unlike uh, Chaumaret, he was known for a cool and competent demeanor. Uh, and we will see a little bit more about why Chaumaret doesn't have that in, in a minute. I also had the Loire and the Argus, uh, two uh, uh, older, less seaworthy ships under uh, Captain Giquel de Touche and Léon Henri de Parnahol. Uh, both of them were Bonapartists who'd served under Napoleon for years. They were experienced mariners. They'd fought at Trafalgar, survived Trafalgar, which is no mean accomplishment. Uh, also Bonapartists and experienced were the uh, junior officers on the Medusa uh, under Chaumaret. Uh, and this is important because Chaumaret in particular is going to have a hard time working with people who have very different political opinions from him. Uh, and that's gonna have some pretty big consequences. Uh, these ships also contained the newly appointed governor of Senegal, Julian Desiree Schmaltz. Uh, in, in the sources he comes through as sort of a, a politician's politician. Charming, practical, uh, dedicated above all to his own survival. Uh, there's going to be some leadership battles between Chamare and uh, Schmaltz as, as things uh, go south, which they're going to fairly quickly. Uh, so even before the expedition left, uh, this is to some degree foreshadowing a spoiler, but uh, it wasn't really a surprise at the time. Chamre was uh, warned, you got to be aware of this thing called the Arguin Bank. Uh, that is a huge sandbank with very shallow water uh, along the coast of Africa in the, the Bay of Arguin, which you can see on that map there in, in black, that little large bay along the, uh, the west coast of Africa, just north of San Luis in modern day Mauritania. Uh, and this was a notorious uh, zone for shipwrecks. Uh, and of course there was also a well-known solution to not get shipwrecked in the uh, Arquin Bank, which was to sail well to sea. Uh, you know, this wasn't the ancient world. Uh, people could navigate at sea. Uh, there was no need to hug the coast. Uh, it took a little longer, but it got you there much more safely. Unfortunately for Chamaray and the Medusa, uh, Schmaltz pushed Chamere to get there as quickly as possible. They were getting a late start. He was eager to get there and get the job done. Uh, so under pressure from Schmaltz, Chamere decided to hug the coast instead of uh, going well out to sea. And this will uh, very quickly prove to be a mistake. The convoy actually separated the Echo, Loire, and Argus uh, under their experienced captains, said uh, to heck with this and steered way out to sea. Uh, they would all reach San Luis safely. Uh, the Medusa will not. Uh, a quick detour here. This is a, a, a copy of the actual map that uh, Sean Murray would have used. Uh, not the actual copy, but you know this is uh, from a 17, 1756 atlas by Jacques Nicolas Bellin. Uh, and even at the time uh, before Sean Murray left, he received a warning from the French Naval Ministry that, quote, maps of the Western coast and Bellin's French hydrography are flawed and it would be dangerous to trust them. Uh, and this was, these were very well and accurate warnings because while this map looks okay, it's got lots of problems. Uh, here's a little zoom in. You might see uh, there's a, a lot of little numbers drawn here. Those are soundings, measures of the depth of the ocean. And that, I, I, I would focus on two things here. Uh, the first is that a lot of these uh, numbers are very small. Uh, these are single digits uh, in many cases. Uh, these are in, in fathoms. And uh, a, a sounding of single digit fathoms is not a safe place for a large warship to be navigating. The second thing you might notice is that there's not that many numbers. Most of this uh, map is blank. Uh, that means that most of this map had not been thoroughly mapped and uh, charted. Uh, so people there were, would largely be sailing blind. Uh, finally, the map itself is just wrong. Uh, the Cap Blanc, that Northern Peninsula there at the top here, uh, was actually four miles further south than uh, this map uh, would believe. So there are lots of problems that uh, going in. Uh, Sean Murray was warned not to trust uh, this map, uh, and he would have done better to listen. 
I mentioned earlier that Sean Murray, uh had trouble working with people with different political opinions from him, uh, which included all of the officers serving under him. Uh, he rapidly stopped listening to them, stopped taking their advice. Uh, and instead, uh, because he himself was not that experienced and, and needed advice on some of these tricky issues of navigation, uh, he took advice from someone named uh, Antoine Richefort. And Richefort was not a sailor. Richefort was one of the passengers on the ship. Uh, he was a, sort of a dilettante, a, a jack of all trades. He had some experience in uh, sailing and navigation, uh, not nearly as much experience as he said he did, uh, and certainly not uh, uh, enough to warrant the confidence with which he asserted his opinions about the best way to sail to Saint, uh, Saint Louis. Uh, the officers, uh, desperate at, uh, for their survival, seeing how this could go wrong, resorted to trying to trick Chamaray. Uh, they convinced him that a cloud they saw was actually the land and said, oh, we're too close, we better steer away. Uh, but that only lasted about 30 miles before Richefort sort of reasserted control and said, we're turning south again. As uh, historian Jonathan Miles notes, uh, the cunning group had taken the trouble to dupe a captain who was no longer in command. Even the other passengers in the ship who had no real experience at sea could tell that something was changing on the morning of July 2nd, 1816, which is not a good day for the Medusa. Uh, in the morning, they observed uh, the sea was turning from uh, deep blue to green. Uh, big schools of fish and kelp were visible. All these are signs of uh, the ocean getting shallower. Uh, it wasn't until afternoon uh, on, that an officer under his own initiative took a sounding, which came back 18 fathoms, uh, about 33 meters, which is, you know, the sh uh, a ship like the Medusa could sail in 18 fathoms, but don't, they don't have a ton of room to spare uh, here. And uh, th this was a signal that we are really close to really shallow water. And finally, at this moment, Chamaray said, okay, we're too close, let's turn back. But it was too late. Uh, as the ship slowly turned and the soundings kept coming back smaller and smaller and smaller numbers, uh, the ship finally shuddered and ran aground on a sandbank. And you had a situation like this. Uh, this is the wrecked Medusa. Uh, it was not a good situation. Uh, there were some attempts to try to refloat the ship. These didn't go anywhere, in, in part because Chamorin Schmaltz refused to throw the heavy but expensive cannons overboard. And finally, it was agreed that it was that everyone needed to abandon ship. There were 400 passengers and crew on the Medusa. Uh, and uh, the ship uh, didn't quite have enough boats to carry everyone. Uh, so it was agreed they'd put as many people on the boats as they could, and they would build a makeshift raft to uh, put everyone else on. And uh, those people on the raft would be towed uh, either to San Luis or just into shore where they could uh, get off and, and walk to San Luis. At least that was the theory. In practice, uh, here's a quick breakdown. Uh, uh, Schmaltz and about 36 other passengers got on the, uh, the best vessel on the ship, the so-called governor's barge. Uh, Chamaray and another 26 sailors got on the captain's barge. Uh, lots of people got on a, a range of other boats here. I won't go through them all. Uh, you should know the long boat, the one that has 88 people on it, that was overloaded, uh, in part because its officer, unlike all the other officers here, refused to leave people behind when he could still cram people on. Uh, Schmaltz uh, could have fit 50 people and hit the governor's barge, but uh, refused to take more people on after 36, uh, even people who were swimming in the water and begging to be pulled out. Uh, there were 17 sailors who remained behind in the Medusa, took a look at the motley crew of ships and said, uh, to heck with that, we're going to take our chances here. Uh, and 150 who piled onto this raft. Uh, and we're going to focus on the people on the raft for a while, because this is where it gets really bad. Uh, the original plan was for the ships to tow the barge. Uh, but as things started to go crazy, the, the barge proved less than seaworthy. Uh, Schmaltz apparently ordered the ropes to be cut and set the barge adrift and the ships would sail on and hopefully, you know, maybe come back and rescue the barge. Uh, this was not a great decision. Uh, one of many not great decisions here. So you can see a, a drawing of the barge uh, as it was being being worked on at about 60 feet by 20 feet. Uh, definitely no oars, maybe no sails. The, 
the sources actually differ in this one. Some of the art depicts it with sails, some depicts it without sails. Uh, but in any case, it wasn't really navigable. Uh, it, it couldn't really go anywhere. It was just sort of drift. Uh, it's also, you know, uh, this kind of heavy ship wood is not actually very buoyant on its own. Uh, the, the raft started actually to sink under the water as soon as 50 people had climbed on board. Uh, so now it was just sort of floating a, a couple feet under the water and people were you know, standing up to their waist on the ship. Uh, their, their only lifeline. There were limited food supplies. They didn't even have a compass or a map. Not that those would have been, you know, practical use, but uh, just goes to show how desperate it was. And all the officers managed to find their way onto better boats. Uh, there was just a midshipman was the highest ranking naval officer on board. Uh, so this is an overloaded raft adrift at sea with limited supplies. Uh, the true nightmare of the wreck of the Medusa is what's going to happen on this raft. And it's going to get bad very quickly. So the first thing that happens, even on day one, uh, the 150 people crowded onto this raft with no railings, sunk under the water, start getting washed overboard. Uh, they start losing people, just they, they look back and someone's gone, fallen off. Morale was low. S some of the soldiers on board, most of the, the people on the raft were soldiers, uh, started breaking into alcohol, to getting drunk. The drunks then began fighting with each other, uh, fighting with their officers. Some of them even tried to destroy the raft. Uh, it's, it's a bad situation. But this is, if this was as bad as it got, it, things would have been okay. Uh, it got way worse. Supplies rapidly diminished. And by the third day, the food was basically gone. And you might guess what happened next. On that third day, the survivors began eating dead bodies. Uh, they turned to cannibalism uh, after only three days at sea. And in the most harrowing moment, uh, after a number of days into the trip, there, when there were only 27 people left of the uh, original 150, uh, many of them were wounded. And there was a brutal calculation made that everyone was going to starve to death, that uh, the wounded and weak were probably going to die even on half rations very quickly, uh, which would just uh, condemn the weak to a slow death while harming the strong. So the 15 healthiest people murdered the other 13. Uh, sorry, other 12. Uh, to try to improve their situation. Uh, so now there are 15 people left out of the original 150, 10%. Uh, here's an, another rendition of the uh, chaotic fighting on board the raft. Uh, as you can see, the wreck and the Verdusa, and especially the raft was a popular subject for art at the time. Uh, but even killing their comrades uh, didn't look like it was going to be enough. By day 11, these 15 survivors were delirious. They were near death. They were being circled by sharks. Finally, on day, morning of day 12, there was a sail sighted, but quickly disappeared over the horizon instead of coming toward them. And finally, two hours after that, the ship did come back. It was the Argus, uh, which had taken the long, slow way, had reached Saint Louis, realized what had gone wrong, and then sent out to look for survivors. Uh, these 15 survivors were, in Miles' uh, words, hardly able to move. Their eyes were sunken. Their beards had matted. Their flesh had shrunk against their skulls as if in readiness for death. So uh, pretty rough. Uh, and these were the lucky ones who'd survived. Just very quickly, uh, the two barges made it to San Luis in a few days with no real issues. Uh, Schmaltz and Jean Marais uh, disembarked. The other boats couldn't make it to San Luis. So they beached on the shore. People had to trek overland. Uh, and there, this wasn't fun. There was sun, sand, thirst. Uh, but most of the people who landed uh, on, the, on the desert nearby survived. Uh, some assistance from the British uh, and some Moorish tribes. Uh, you know, had the raft been towed to land, as was the original plan, and the 150 people there disembarked, things probably would have gone a lot better. Uh, certainly far fewer than the 135 people who died would have uh, perished if that had happened. The 17 who uh, stayed on board also were unfortunate. Uh, rescue ship didn't get there till 52 days after the ship was abandoned. Uh, only three of the 17 were still there and alive. Apparently they'd actually done pretty well for a couple of weeks, but then some lost patience and uh, set off on their own and were never seen again. So just to wrap up pretty quickly here, uh, accounts of the uh, disaster quickly appeared in French and British newspapers. Uh, Chamaret, 
uh, to his surprise, but not really to anyone else's, uh, was brought up in a court martial. Uh, he was uh, faced five charges, uh, and he was acquitted of three of them. Uh, he was convicted of incompetent navigation, which is absolutely true. Uh, and he was convicted of abandoning his ship, of getting on that lifeboat uh, and not waiting to be the last one off the ship, which if you know anything about Navy, that's a big deal. It's not that the captain has to go down with the ship, but the captain isn't supposed to flee early. This was actually a capital crime in the French Navy. Uh, but despite facing a death sentence, Chamaray was sentenced to just three years in prison, which was widely seen as a whitewash. Uh, despite this, or because of it, in part, uh, the wreck of the Medusa became a major scandal. It was a subject of huge public attention. There are articles, books, uh, coverage of the trial, there were debates in parliament. And it went on for years. It was a, a major subject. Uh, it was sort of the Titanic of its day. Uh, and one of the many people who became obsessed with the story of the Medusa was a painter named uh, Theodore Jericho. Jericho was actually a latecomer to the story. He didn't, it showed no signs of interest in the 1816, 1817, but he became obsessed in 1818 uh, and decided that it would be the focus of his next big work. Jericho uh, really threw himself wholeheartedly uh, into this project. He interviewed survivors. He studied bodies from a morgue to better capture and depict dead and dying bodies. He spent, worked on the painting for a full year. Uh, and you've seen what he produced, uh, the Raft of the Medusa, which captures uh, you know, uh, the depravity of humanity, the deadliness of nature, uh, the sense of hope. Uh, it's a, a, a stunning composition, politically dynamite. Uh, I'm running out of time here. I want to be able to take some questions. So I'll, I'll just show you two more angles uh, of this painting that I find really sort of transform how I view it. Uh, <clears throat> First, this is uh, uh, help, really helps illustrate how the painting is constructed. Uh, Jericho uh, structured the uh, ship and the, the people on it into sort of two pyramidical structures, uh, which I, I, you, I can't unsee this now that I've seen it. Uh, it's, a, it's a very striking and, and visually compelling way to arrange the painting. And more interesting, you'll note this central figure, the most prominent figure in the painting, the one who is at the top, uh, and is waving, trying to attract the attention of the ship, is a black man. Uh, and that is not an accident. Uh, it is not incidental. Uh, it's a deliberate uh, choice by Jerry Coe, uh, who was active in abolitionist circles in France at the time, uh, was uh, friends with uh, people who were advocating for the abolition of slavery, of the slave trade, for more equal treatment between the races. Uh, that's actually a real person there. Uh, there was a black soldier who was on the raft, who survived to the end, named Jean Charles. He actually died shortly after uh, a fair number of the survivors, those 15, didn't make it very long. Uh, his position, you know, as the most prominent person was an invention of Jerry Coe with he composed the painting, but uh, this was a real person. And I'll finally, there's, there are other real people on here, most notably that guy in red, that's Alexandre Corriard. Uh, he's another survivor. Uh, he wrote one of the most famous accounts of the wreck of the Medusa. And uh, he was, for many years, an outspoken political activist. Uh, uh, he was involved in the Carbonari conspiracies that hit France later on. We'll learn more about those in the siècle. And you can see that he's pointing both toward the Argus, but also in the direction of Jean Charles, directing his attention there toward this figure of hope and salvation. And by putting this real, this prominent person and having him direct our attention toward Jean Charles, toward uh, the black man on the ship, uh, is a very deliberate choice by uh, Jerry Coe uh, and reflects some of those issues about slavery and uh, the slave trade and the transformation of uh, European colonialism that's going on at this moment. Uh, it's a very interesting painting. You could talk for 30 minutes or more just about the painting itself. Uh, and I'm already out of time, so I'm just going to wrap up now. Uh, uh, here you can see some of the sources uh, that I drew on here. Uh, and if you want to learn more about this period, you can check out the Siecla at thesiecla.com or wherever you get podcasts. Wow, I was didn't know what I was in for when I came when I heard this. Um, so we have about five minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, uh, raise up your hand if you want to speak them out or write them in the chat very quickly. Um, but just in, in a brief synopsis, uh, what brought you to talk about this one? 
uh, partly the theme was crossings. And this was a famous incident that I'd been uh, uh, looking to cover for a while and it, it fit the, the theme better than anything else. Uh, it's also you know, something that I hadn't covered like when my narrative was in 1816. I've, I'm sort of saving it. Uh, it. It deserves its own episode of the show. It'll get one. Uh, I'm actually gonna, gonna write, turn this into a script rather than just release the, the raw audio here, I think. Uh, and it's, I think it's gonna kick off a, a sort of mini series uh, talking about French colonialism in the, during the Bourbon Restoration, uh, which is important because Algeria is about to happen and that's going to be really important for uh, what's about to come. Uh, as of course, you know, intrinsically important because France is a colonial power and its decisions are gonna have a huge impact on the lives of people and slaves and places like Senegal, more uh, uh, Madagascar and other places all around the world. And we have a question from Steve. Do we know why it took the rescue boat so long to get to the ship? Uh, part of it was the map sucked and it was no one knew exactly where to go. Uh, but the biggest, the bigger part of it was that uh, Schmaltz and uh, Sean Murray appeared to have been in no real hurry. And in fact, when they, they did send out the rescuers, part of it was not so much to rescue the people, but to rescue the 70,000 pounds of gold frocks that were left on the ship. Uh, that was the uh, one of the, the big priority for, for Schmaltz to, uh, to get the gold that was supposed to fund uh, the, the French colony there. Uh, but, you know, these, these were not humanitarians. Uh, uh, it was actually the, the British who had, were currently in control of uh, uh, St. Louis uh, were, showed notably more compassion and care and exerted more effort on behalf of the survivors than uh, Schmaltz and Chamere did. Question from Dirk. Did the scandal lead to reform of the French Navy and the role of the emigres? Sort of. Uh, in about 1818, I, I think maybe 1817, uh, there was a, a, the French uh, Minister of War uh, spearheaded a military reform uh, named him the Gouvion Saint Cyr Law, uh, which removed some of the king's discretion to appoint officers, uh, reserved a, a number of roles for people coming up from the ranks for. Uh, you know, for attending military school or uh, serving for a certain number of years. Uh, did, the king still had some uh, powers of appointment. Uh, this wasn't only a reaction to uh, the, the wreck of the Medusa, but uh, there was certainly a contributing factor in building up support uh, to pass this. This was, this was part of the, what's called the liberal restoration when Louis had appointed a bunch of ministers who were moderate or liberal in their inclinations. Uh, and this is one of their big reforms was to Sort of create a more professional army, one who's less per, not not so much personally loyal to the king, but focused on competence. Uh, I, I thought about putting a slide in there on the the Sancier law, but the, the connection is indirect, and also uh, a lot of its reforms were sort of walked back in the years that, that followed. Eventually, France would end up with a, a fully professional military, uh, but it was a it was a slow and halting process. Wikipedia uh, the Wikipedia page for this uh, directly credits the wreck with uh, prompting the law, but that's uh, actually stronger than the sources support. Alrighty, two minutes, speak now or forever hold your peace. If you're writing, please raise your hand so we know you're, you're, you're writing out stuff too. <laughs> also hop over into the chat room for at least a few minutes. Uh, if people want to continue this, uh, Otherwise, uh, pour myself a drink and go watch the next session. <laughs> All righty. Well, I think we're going to call it there, everyone. Thank you for coming today. And thank you guys for being awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, David. Great presentation. <laughs>